Good evening. Welcome to Book Launch. I'm Darren Baker, and in this edition, we're going to take a look at a book that is already well past its launch date in 2019. It's one of my own, actually, called The Two Eleanors of Henry III, The Lives of Eleanor Provence and Eleanor de Montfort. It follows my previous biographies of their husbands, Henry III, and his friend turned adversary, Simon de Montfort. And it was conceived as the third and final book of a trilogy centered around these four remarkable characters. So who were they? Henry III was the King of England from 1216 to 1272. His greatest achievement was the building of Westminster Abbey, which was recently on full display at the funeral of the late Queen. But the final decade of his reign was marred by a family struggle, namely his youngest sister, Eleanor, standing side by side with her husband, Simon de Montfort, as relations between the two men deteriorated. That struggle cost her the friendship of the other Eleanor of our story, her sister-in-law, the Queen. Like Simon de Montfort, Eleanor of Provence was born and raised in the south of what is modern day France. She came to England in 1236 to marry Henry, which was two years before the de Montforts got married. Now, if we fast forward 25 years, we see that the divisions between the king and the queen on one side and the de Montforts on the other erupt in civil war. This culminates in one of the most dramatic and tumultuous periods in English history, and the two Eleanors were at the heart of it every step of the way. Here with me to talk about them is Louise Wilkinson, a professor of medieval studies at Lincoln University and the author of numerous books and studies, most notably the role and influence of women in the 13th century. I have here her biography of Eleanor de Montfort, which is called A Rebel Countess in Medieval England and her latest work, which is the first complete translation and analysis of Eleanor's household role, a phenomenal feat, and trust me, an absolutely enjoyable and instructive read. Well, let's start with Eleanor de Montfort, since she is, after all, the, the older of the two. So do we know when she was born and, and where? Well, this is the great problem with working on royal women and especially younger daughters actually. Her birth did go pretty much unrecorded. Um, so when we're estimating when she was born we have to sort of calculate her birth in relation to that of her older sister Isabella who was probably born in 1214. Um, conventionally Eleanor's birth is dated to 1215, the year of Magna Carta, but actually it's quite possible she was born in 1216. Can you take us quickly through her siblings? Now, now there, of course, is Henry. He's the king. He's the first one. And who's the, the brother behind him? Well, her eldest brother was Henry. And then next in line, if you like, was Richard, who became Earl of Cornwall. Um, so her oldest sister, who's not in the right order here on this role, sadly, um, was actually Joan, who became uh, Queen of Scots. So this, this is Joan here, right? Yeah. Yep, so there's Joan. Mm -hmm. And her other sister was Isabella, who actually remained unmarried for a number of years. She didn't marry till 1235. But when she did marry, she made a glittering match um, with Emperor Frederick II of Hohenstaufen. We have here the Empress Isabella and Queen Joan of Scotland. So Eleanor was basically the only of the siblings who never reached a, a sort of uh, queenly dignity, right? Mm. And um, her marriage was sort of negotiated when she was very, very young. So perhaps, you know, no right. more than eight or nine years old. Right. Um, she was betrothed in 1221 and then actually married in 1224. So you see here, these are her, her brood, okay, from Simon de Montfort. But as, as Louise has indicated, that Simon wasn't her first husband. Her first husband was William Marshall Jr. Um, so he was the controller of the Earldom of Pembroke 
and he had vast estates across England, Southern Wales and Ireland. William's abrupt death created a problem because Eleanor had not borne him any children. So Eleanor was entitled as a widow to a third of William Marshall Jr's estates in England, Ireland and Wales, so a massive amount of land. So that's our uh, introduction to Eleanor, the future Eleanor de Montfort. So now let's talk a little bit about Eleanor of Provence. So this is Henry and Eleanor. So Eleanor's small stature represents the fact that she was probably only about 12 years old mm -hmm. at the time. So here we have a, a corbel in Westminster Abbey, which is presumed to be Eleanor. She, we move along a couple of years. It's 1238. It's January. The Christmas celebrations are over and a secret wedding takes place. In 1238, in a chapel off the corner of the King's Chamber in the Palace of Westminster, a clandestine marriage took place between Eleanor, the King's youngest sister, and Simon de Montfort, um, one of the King's rising stars, a leading counsellor of Henry III's court, who was himself, though, the third son of a French count, Count, albeit a very famous one, Simon de Montfort, the Albigensian Crusader. Mm -hmm. But this was a remarkable marriage because it really was truly secret. If you look at the royal records for the days around when we know this marriage took place, they're still written by the clerks as though Eleanor is the widowed Countess of Pembroke. There's no hint that right. she's now engaged in this secret marriage in the king's presence with barely anyone else there. This is our man Simon on horseback. You know, he came from, uh, as, as Louise mentioned, very famous family, uh, the, the Crusaders of South France. He impressed everyone he ever met, and Henry included. So, as, as Louise said, a rising star at court. And, but it, he was a younger son. He, he owed everything to Henry, and, and Eleanor is a princess of the realms. And when news of the marriage leaked out in England, there was just a massive uproar, right. um, an outcry from all the great lay magnates. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury was a really big, vociferous opponent of the match. Well, Simon yeah. was able to buy his dispensation. Well, we, we, we see Henry at work here because, <laughs> you know, the Archbishop says, you know, I have a lot of gripes again about everything and I'm going to go to Rome <laughs> to take care of it. And Henry says, yeah, why don't you do that? Go to Rome, have a good trip. And, and then he's out of the country. He he marries Eleanor to Simon. We, we, we might say that Simon and Henry were really good friends and this this played a role in Henry deciding you know, this is an up-and-coming guy. He's very talented. I want him by my side. And so he's willing to weather the storm that arises on account of it. But Only within, up <laughs> yeah, within uh, what is it, about 18 months, the storm really breaks open. So we have uh, the birth of Edward. So we have an heir to the throne. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about that first because that brings us back to Eleanor Provence. So Eleanor has a great success story for us, right? Initially, it was feared that Eleanor Provence was barren. Yeah. Um, and she even went on pilgrimage with Henry's sister Joan when she was in the country to Canterbury. And both women were believed to have gone to Beckett's shrine to pe pray for an heir. But of course, the concerns about Eleanor Provence proved ill-founded and she gave birth to the Lord Edward in 1239. And she then went on to have a splendid ceremony, as all queens should, for her purification. Right. And, and it was then that controversy struck, wasn't it, Darren? Yeah, the backstory there is that Simon, he ended up borrowing a lot of money to establish himself in England. Because it's one thing for the king to, to more or less uh, recognize your claim, but it's another one that you have to support that claim yourself. And Simon ran up massive debts, even to uh, Eleanor Provence's relatives. And he just took the audacious step of saying, you know what, don't worry about it. My, my buddy, my, my brother-in-law, the king will cover it. And Henry finds out. Simon and Eleanor fled. They left behind their baby son. It was so, so sudden. So they are out of the realm. But Eleanor of Provence has another great success story, which happened on this very day, the 29th of September, 1240, right? 
Which, new, which success story is this, Darren? A new baby, <laughs> a new baby Margaret is Another born. Another baby, okay, Margaret, yeah. the future queen of Scotland. Oh, the more, the more babies, the better for the royal <laughs> family, right? so, yes, They did Margaret. have a successful marriage in terms of um, producing children, and they were incredibly loving parents as well. Yeah. So they, yeah. they had in this space of six years, so they had Edward, Margaret, Beatrice Combs, and then Edmund. So four children. And, you know, the, through the influence of Eleanor Provence, they are all raised together at Windsor, which is sort of breaking with the norm, right? I mean, when Eleanor de Montfort was growing up, she and her siblings were all raised separately, right? They were, but I think that was because there was a real concern about the security of the English throne and having all the royal children together during the deeply unstable period of Henry III's early minority, okay. actually. And so I think I rather like this idea that Eleanor Provence had a royal nursery at Windsor, which is, of course, reflected in her surviving household roles, which one of my students is editing. Mm -hmm. um, and also we get lots of sort of anecdotal references to as well in various chronicles, which really sort of demonstrate her interest and investment in her children. Um, so there's a lovely account in one of the chronicles of her um, spending time with Edward and set with her doctors um, when he was poorly and in danger um, at Bewley Abbey. Was it for three weeks? It was something like that. Right, right. Three, yeah, he was, uh, he was quite deathly ill and... And, you know, uh, a woman staying within the environs of this, this abbey was just unheard of. And she says, well, I'm staying anyway. And I, I believe it cost two of the officials their jobs. I mean, it was such a scandal. But, and also, when we look at this Savoyard influence, because, of course, the, the English chroniclers really didn't have much good to say about them. But there's Peter of Savoy going to Windsor. And he sees here is the royal nursery, and right outside is a dung heap. He's saying, "Hey, people, you can't have that. You know, move. You know, let's go. Let's clean this place up." So, I mean, later in the children's lives, there's nice sort of evidence of their sort of attachment to their mother. So, one of the things that I find most striking is that lovely story of how sort of Margaret, um, when Margaret, her daughter, goes off to become queen of Scotland. Um, she receives, Eleanor Provence receives reports that Margaret's being ill-treated and sort of then takes action with Henry to ensure that Margaret's interests are looked after. Mm -hmm. But then later when Margaret is pregnant, she actually contrives to stay in England, although she's bearing potentially the Scottish heir, and have her baby with her mother. And um, Eleanor's other daughter, Beatrice, um, the other daughter who lives into adulthood, um, she, when she goes on crusade later on in sort of 1270 or so, um, some of the, her daughters, her children rather, are placed, placed with Eleanor Provence. So I think that shows really nice evidence of strong family attachment. Okay, so let's move back now a little bit to Eleanor de Montfort. We're in the 1240s. And let's look at a personal, uh, ha have a personal view of her. And it's a very famous story about her visiting Waverley Abbey. She visited Waverley on Palm Sunday with Simon and her sons Henry and Simon Jr. They attended a sermon in the chapter house altogether, they watched a procession and they observed the mass in this great Cistercian Abbey. So we have this very close relationship with this mm -hmm. religious house on the one hand, on the other she has a good friend in Adam Marsh who is a Franciscan uh, well, he's a Franciscan who's very popular for his sermons. He's, he's well known, friends with the king and queen, a lot of people. And his letters have survived. And a couple of them directed to Eleanor sort of take issue with some things. This first one, what, what are we looking at there? What's, well, what's, Adam, I, what's Adam's problem with Eleanor? Well, Eleanor clearly had rather a lively temper on her. And I suspect that the Montfort marriage, which was fundamentally a love match in its origin, was also quite a tempestuous one. And I think that the couple had blazing rows. And I also think that Eleanor was not afraid of showing her anger in public. Right. And so Marsh writes her this series of letters um, warning her, that I think one of them, um, that anger killeth the foolish right. and lovely things like that. And pointing out that that behaviour goes completely against Christian ideals for womanhood, 
of you know obe obedience humility submission to your husband yeah well and, we, we, and i we, love the fact that he's so worried about how her reputation is being damaged you know by reports of these which have reached his ears well it's very very nice translation of soiling your reputation <laughs> and, and de demonic fits of anger so and the the one below this comes from a different letter and that now he takes issue with her um her sort of um her, her attire leader. yes but, yeah. and actually he 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 tells her off actually as well for you know the way she's dressing her hair and her love of binary right. and this of course re relates to the um sort of ecclesiastical condemnation of the love of finery it's all about vanity and that's you know not a good thing well, you, um, but actually it tells us a bit about what she was probably wearing she was looking every inch the fine regal countess you know a woman of royal birth who'd married an owl a man who was made an owl um so right. i think as her second husband so i think it's lovely because actually I, I have tremendous sympathy for eleanor in these letters because i just love the fact that she clearly liked a nice frock she clearly liked you know to wear fine things that befitted her rank right and, well, and well, also well, she what would husband. adam be wearing <laughs> <laughs> well, he would have been wearing his habit, hopefully, as a yeah. So, and he being a model of apostolic poverty to the court, one would hope. Right, so, yeah. yeah. So you know, and he and and you could see this very strong sexualization. You know, this idea between face of a whore and the face of chastity yeah, it pleases no one except <laughs> shameless pimps. I mean, Adam Adam doesn't mince his words, does he? <laughs> no, he doesn't. And I, do, I find it remarkable the way that he does address this to her so directly, because she still is, for him, a patroness. You know, someone well, who's yeah, and they're friends. They're basically friends. Well, he's her confessor, isn't he, as well? Right, right. I mean, yeah. he, it's nice that he could talk openly to her and mm -hmm. and maybe sort of, you know, nudge Simon a bit. Hey, you know, give, give her a bit of a talking to there. So. And also, he knows them so well. There's one of his letters where he actually sends a report. Where's one of the letters of his that he sends a report that she'd gone into a false labor, but she was OK now, yeah. um, which is incredibly intimate, personal knowledge to relate to anyone really right, right, right. so i think that's quite special actually right good so now we're going to move into the 1250s and mm -hmm. we see by this time eleanor of provence she would have been in her 30s and she is the mother of four children two girls and two boys and Henry has this immense problem in his last overseas possession, Gascony. Uh, he sent Simon down there to, to manage the problem, but <laughs> after some initial success, it became quite a mess. Eleanor de Montfort joined him on occasion down there. So in 1253, Henry says, all right, it looks like I got to do everything myself. So he goes down there. And he names his wife Eleanor Provence Regent. And it's very important we point that out, that he names her the Regent, because a lot of history said her and Richard of Cornwall, which is not exactly true, is it? They were appointed as joint regents, but if you look at all the sort of parchment work, it's very clear that it's the Queen first. Well, it's the Queen, and that's the case sort Richard's of Richard to counsel to her, her. Yeah, to be her counselor yeah well but we can see in all the letters that were issued for the rest of that year 1253 i mean richard only appears in in the big money you know problems but eleanor's the queen who's pregnant at the time who's actually right. authorizing an awful lot of the writs and so well, on. she's she's five months pregnant and we even see uh, a writ come out of the chancery on the day she gives birth to catherine 20 which is amazing isn't amazing. it she yeah. she's she's like yes come in come in what do you need <laughs> you know? she's not as withdrawn perhaps as she was meant to be <laughs> <laughs> well but yeah. so she would have she would have had her churching sometime around the feast of saint Ed, uh, uh, edward the confessor so that would have been about the 5th of january richard's birthday in fact mm. but we see that there was a parliament held in late december and matthew paris actually names eleanor at being at that parliament so mm. she sort of skipped out before her her churching and this parliament 
was very important because it led to the next parliament, namely that Henry needs a special tax because of the problems down in the South. And he's asking Eleanor and Richard to manage it for him. And what do they do basically? What is the great constitutional innovation here? And they're involved in um, issuing summons for knights to attend the parliament. Um, it's quite difficult to know precisely when knights did really truly begin attending parliament because the records of the early parliaments are so vague when these great assemblies start being called parliaments in Henry oh. III's reign. But, it, but it's just remarkable that we do have this queen consort summoning men who will come into what be will later become the House of Commons. Well, I like to give uh, show the writ here. There's the Latin mm -hmm. above with the translation, and very important. It says, yeah. you know, this, and uh, we charge that you shall have two lawful and discreet knights specially elected by the county. So they're basic. In a way, this is kind of democracy in action, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it is. A, it's a good prototype, isn't it? It is fascinating because it does broaden all these sort of things that become enacted in Henry's reign broaden the membership of parliament to something which is closer to what we understand it is uh, understand it has today so it yeah. is it's an, it's a really exciting period of history this and it's wonderful that this happens although she's acting on her husband's behalf at the end of her regency eleanor goes to france to join henry we have that magnificent reunion of the provencal sisters and their mother in paris yeah. and during this time uh henry negotiates the sicilian business now he's got quite a bit of criticism for that we won't get into it here because i happen to be in that small minority that says go henry yeah uh but we know eleanor certainly supported it Yes, not, she did what she wanted, a, a crown for her younger son, Edmund, didn't well, she? Well, <laughs> yes, it, it, is, it is the crown, but we, we have to remember that Henry's settlement in Gascony, so he, he makes mm. this treaty with Castile. Basically, mm. Edward will marry the half-sister, right? Mm. Eleanor of Castile. Okay, so Henry is more or less in alliance with Castile, but Alfonso... He wanted Edward to be a great landed prince. And Henry basically gave him everything. <laughs> I mean, there was nothing left for Edmund. He was going to be just like his grandfather, a lackland. So I kind of see this, if they can't get the crown of Sicily, well, they can get some great principality to give the poor boy because I'm also a third son and I know what it's like to be down <laughs> down the line when it comes time you know? so um anyway so that's that's the sicilian business we get that out of the way so let's move on to 1258 this is the start of the reform period in england and eleanor of provence has some terrible worries other than whether the the the, the realm needs reform um, edward um who received a greater panage a great collection of lands as part of his marriage to Eleanor of Castile and found that many of those lands were under attack due to a resurgence of the Welsh under the great Prince Llewellyn. And he was worried about really the costs of defending his lands in the face of some very poor um, English attempts at defence. And he moved in out of the orbit of the Savoyards, his mother's kin, Mm -hmm. And into that of actually his father's half siblings, the Lusignons, who'd arrived in England to make their fortune in 1247. Um, and so Edward moved into the Lusignons as a means of, sort of getting more money, getting more support. And this just completely alarmed the Queen, and quite understandably so, because they were her arch rivals for the King's favour. Right. So more or less, she she uses this. Uh, groundbreaking parliament in Oxford to more or less behind the scenes to engineer their ouster. Yeah, well, I think she, I think there are a lot of um, <laughs> aristocrats, um, earls and barons in England who by this time are completely fed up with Henry III's government. Um, so they feel alienated by the patronage and generosity that they perceive as being shown towards the Lusignons. And then in the spring of 1258, seven magnates, including Simon de Montfort, Eleanor de Montfort's husband, marched on the king at Westminster 
and essentially force the king to accept reform. Yeah, well, that that may have happened, may not have happened. But uh, what what is I find very interesting is that by ousting the Lusignan, so basically two of the greatest lords in the land or, or Henry supporters are gone. Then in the summer, we have the mysterious poisoning of Richard de Clare. So he's out oh, of yes. the picture. <laughs> yeah. And basically, this is Simon's opportunity to just slip right in and, and take command of the reform process. So um, what this leads us to is Henry's other cherished project, which is peace with France. Mm. So he has a treaty in, in progress or making a treaty in progress. He's asked Simon, his brother-in-law, his trusted friend, to go to France and negotiate it. And everything's going all right. And then it comes time to, um, to ratify the treaty and somebody springs a surprise. It have been Simon manipulating the process in his favor um, because as part of the negotiations, Louis IX insists that Henry III's siblings renounce their claims to the former Angevin territories, you know, long lost in John's reign and in, around the events of 1204. And um, so Eleanor is supposed to renounce her claims in this period to those territories. And what does she do? Or well, what did she do? She refused. And she obstructed with her husband the peace negotiations for about nine months or so. And what was her reason? Well, she wanted... Um, and I think Simon wanted this as well, to basically get some sort of settlement of their financial problems. Right. So Simon had served as the king's lieutenant in Gascony and had racked up huge debts in royal service. And then there was the ongoing issue that never, ever went away of the money that was owing to Eleanor um, for her martial dower. And the couple really wanted that to be settled because I think they were a couple who tended to live beyond their means. and they did need a sound financial base because they had a growing family of sons um, that they needed to provide for. But this is where you see Simon really coming in with that sort of shrewdness because mm. he's one of the negotiators of the treaty mm. and he knows that Louis has to pay Henry compensation in the form of a thousand knights in the field for one year or 500 for two years. And that's, that's quite a lot of money. It ends up being about 33,000 pounds. And so when Henry establishes an arbitration panel to consider the Montfort, the Montfort uh, their demands for land and money, Simon and Eleanor <laughs> hand them a bill saying, all right, we, we want all our back money to the tune of 25,000 pounds, which was equal to one year of royal revenue. I mean, it was just astounding that that they would take that action. And I, I think from that point on, Henry thought, oh my Lord, what am I, what am I going to do with these two? Eleanor finally resigned her claim in December 1259. Yeah. yeah um, so. But yeah. Uh, by that time, relations between Henry and Eleanor Provence with the Montforts is, is pretty much ruptured. I think there's, mm -hmm. there's no going back by that point. So, and in 1261, Henry resumes full authority. He basically tells the barons and the council, look, I let you try to run the realm. You made an absolute mess of it. So I'm taking it back. And Simon does what? Simon, um, in 1261, there's a whole load of, there's a lot of toing and froing in the 1260s between the different sides. As one side tries to take over, then the other. Frequently, they call upon the French court to sort of intervene um, and Louis IX to mediate. Um, but basically, what happens is that the Montforts end up going to France um, and they remain there until April 1263. And well, having been persuaded by a group of um, English sort of barons, um, they return. And it's really then that Simon becomes a major leader. As you say, the uh, Simon came back. And so we have war in 1263. It, it's often called a baron's war. I, I have to disagree with it. I know the chroniclers use that expression, but I see his support coming mainly from the church and from freemen, urban dwellers, 
lots of people who have gripes and and a lot of them like this idea of get the foreigner. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Simon himself was technically obviously a Frenchman. Well, so it's he, always interesting how he sort of adopted in the narratives as a sort of native baron. I, 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 think I, I just, always find it slightly sort of ironic and puzzling. I, I think really. the chroniclers like that idea of irony because mm. back in the 1230s, when there wasn't this, this great tempest, you know, Matthew Paris referred to Simon as an Englishman, you know, so I, I really don't, I, I think that this is something that just comes about because of the struggle, but uh, this idea of get the foreigner, it, it comes to a head in London. You know, Henry and uh, his queen are in, in Tower of London and the people are up in arms because Edward has robbed the bank and all that. So Eleanor basically takes ship for Windsor, tries to, for her, her safety. And what happens after she leaves the wharf? She gets attacked, doesn't she, by the Londoners. It's reported in various chronicles. Who, they pelt her with stones and mud and they shout obscenities at her. As a, as a foreign queen in a particularly sort of xenophobic moment, she was an easy target, wasn't she, as well? Yeah, exactly. And she, she, I mean, if you look at some of the chroniclers who write about her, some of them who are particularly partisan towards the Montfort site, like, there's a lovely passage in the Melrose Chronicle where she's basically blamed for the Second Baron's War. Right. No. Yeah. Quite unfairly, I think. <laughs> well, also, she... the Battle of Lewis, Henry and Edward are captured, and Eleanor at this time is in France. You know, she's sort of whipping up support, and um, so what does she do? Well, she writes to all the most important people. She's lobbying the papal curia during this period. She's negotiating with the French king. Um, she's writing as well in this period to Alphonse of Poitiers. She's trying to raise a group of mercenaries and a fleet um, during her husband's captivity um, to invade England and secure his release. And it is a sign that she did cause real panic among the Montfortian party in England yeah. um, because um, Simon rushed down to Barham, down in Kent, um, and all the forces were sort of raised in anticipation of the Queen's invasion, which of course never ultimately came. Yeah, but even during that time, Eleanor of Provence, she conceived this idea of springing Edward. You know that in November 1264, Edward's followers, probably with a good deal of input from his mother, attempted to spring him from Wallingford. And as a result of this threat, um, Richard of Cornwall, um, another captive, um, and the Lord Edward were all moved to the greater security of the great Montfortian stronghold of Kenilworth. Well, I, uh, what's interesting, this is the one point where the two Eleanors are sort of on, how to say, they're, they're, they're dueling it out because Eleanor de Montfort was basically the custodian of these captives. So she's in charge at Wallingford and Eleanor of Provence is trying to spring them from, from Wallingford. But as you say, it, it, it fails. They, they threaten to launch Edward over the rampart. So, and they end up in Kenilworth. So in the spring of 1265, after she left Wallingford, um, Eleanor moved to Odium and she was in residence there for March and April and May. And when one of the great reforming parliaments broke up in this year, in March, where did they all head? and they all headed down to Odium. So Eleanor entertained her husband and also the Lord Edward and various others. Um, so she really was at the heart of sort of political affairs in this period. She kept here her own great household and she can, seems to have played a sort of central role really as a sort of relay station um, for the Montfortian regime in the South. Um, and with the Queen overseas in exile, um, with the Lord Edward's own bride, Eleanor of Castile, in a sort of form of quite sort of poor confinement herself. She was the most important and I think influential woman in England at this time. Well, after Edward escapes, so, but she moves to Dover, right? To sort of. Yeah, so the Lord that. Edward escaped from Montfortian custody um, at Hereford on the 28th of May 
1265. This provoked absolute panic among the Mortfortians, which you can actually trace in Eleanor's household role. And Eleanor travelled first to Porchester Castle, which was a much greater stronghold on the Hampshire coast, and then all the way across to Dover, which of course controlled access to England across the Straits of Dover and the English Channel. So she took up residence at Dover and she remained there for June and July. Unfortunately for her, though, um, the Lord Edward quickly gathered supporters um, and allies in the Welsh marches and began to pursue um, Earl Simon, Eleanor's husband, and this brought them to a great battle, a great battle that was fought at Evesham on the 4th of August 1265. The Earl Simon was killed, probably by a death squad sent by the Lord Edward. And so was Henry, um, Eleanor and Simon's eldest son. I think Eleanor, Eleanor de Montfort, she held out with her remaining children in Dover for a month, maybe two. And then Edward sort of prized her out and she went off to France, right? Never to return? Yep. So she went into exile on the 28th of October, um, having smuggled two of her surviving younger sons out earlier. So Richard and Amory to the continent. And Eleanor sort of very sort of thoughtfully negotiated um, a return to peace for those of her household who didn't want to accompany her into exile. Yeah. And she went into exile in France. Um, her surviving sons who needed to make it out of the country made it to her in France in 1266. And there's a lovely charter that survives, um, a transcription of which survives in now the Bibliothèque Nationale. Um, which shows Eleanor with her sons in 1266 in France, which is right, yeah. um, quite reassuring. And then right. eventually she entered um, the Dominican nunnery at Montagi, which was a Montfort family foundation in right. widowhood. This shows uh, the, her sons, Guy and Simon, they kill her nephew, Henry of Almain, in a church in Viterbo. This is Richard mm -hmm. of Cornwall's son. And so this shows you the bad blood that existed within the family, this sort of blood feud, which basically uh, the de Montforts never really fully recovered from it. And um, we don't know if Eleanor ever sent any condolences to her brother Richard over it, but uh, very, very tragic affair, really scandalized uh, Europe, right? I think it shows how much bad blood there was between the Montforts after Earl Simon's death and Henry right. III's descendants, yeah. you know, um, I just, I really, it just shows so much, how much hatred has arisen. This is Eleanor's seal, Eleanor de Montfort's a facsimile of her seal. You can see her sort of as, as in a sort of matronly form, by then maybe uh, it represents how she would have looked at montages as a as a as a nun again, we might say. All right. Uh, so finally, so Eleanor basically dies in exile. And we what about Eleanor Provence? How does she spend her final years? Well, Eleanor Provence outlived her husband, um, received a very large dower as her widow share of her dead husband's lands. And she sort of built a life for herself eventually in the 1280s at the great nunnery at Amesbury. Mm -hmm. which was long established, long connected with the royal house. And it, what I rather like about her period of time at Amesbury is she oversaw the admission of a number of her granddaughters, at least two, and other, a group of other young noble women as well. And then she entered that community herself. Mm -hmm. And she still wrote regularly to her son, um, the new king, Edward I, after his accession and into his well into his reign. Mm -hmm. And I always have this sort of impression of Eleanor of Provence, this sort of great, you know, religious and spiritual grandmother. And she took a very active interest in the lives of her grandsons as well by Edward. Well, um, I, if you go there to Am Amesbury, that, that where the, the nunnery stood, it, it's on private ground today, but it's very, very close to Stonehenge. And you can almost sort of imagine Eleanor kind of walking amidst the ruins because she and Henry had that bit of a romantic mystic side with King Arthur and and all all that uh, you know there's that wonderful idea that 
for their honeymoon, Henry took Eleanor Provence to Glastonbury to see the graves of Arthur and Guinevere. And I believe Guinevere, she also entered a nunnery there at Amesbury. I don't know if that influenced Eleanor Provence, but I will just show you this, this nice tree here. This is where the high altar of the nunnery was said to be. So if Eleanor was buried there while she has this beautiful tree above her now, and um, she was an avid gardener, so I think she uh, she would like this sort of serene environment she she ended up in. Okay, well, I think that's about it for the two Eleanors. That's great, and Louise. I thank you very much for joining me for this discussion. Uh, I hope everyone got a lot out of it. The book again is called "The Two Eleanors of Henry the Third." Um, fascinating women. I it's it's one of probably one of the my favorite projects that I've undertaken. So anyway, great. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us. And um, I hope we can have this uh, discussion again, you know, about all these fascinating characters. All right. Great. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.